Hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. We wanted to start off by saying a, a thank you to you for being here and joining us tonight and participating in this um, celebration of national parks and poetry. And we want to start also by thanking our poets, um, both those reading tonight, those in the anthology and those who have submitted work to our series over the past five years. Um, this project would not have come to fruition um, without your work, your time and your encouragement and enthusiasm. And we're so glad you're here. Um, we wanted to backtrack slightly as we get started to just tell you a little bit about how this book came to be, which starts with the story of how Parks and Points came to be. Yeah, that's true. So um, Parks and Points started around the centennial of the National Park Service for us, uh, 2016. Both Amy Beth and I uh, discovered that we had, you know, a shared love for public lands, uh, national, state, and local parks. Mm -hmm. And so it became a project where we put together some of our writing, some of our uh, our travel tips, our own like ref reflective writing, but then started publishing other people's works and realized that it was a bit more of um, a platform for uh, for sharing uh, our love and uh, other people's interest in public lands. Yeah, sort of a combination of practical ways to explore the parks and then more introspective and reflective ways to explore our experiences in the parks. And because of that, we built a annual poetry contest, I'm sorry, an annual essay contest and then um, a poetry series that um, the first year of our poetry series, we received 300 submissions. And it was really an amazing um, thing for us to realize just how much room there was to share this kind of work. And we, you know, of course, are so grateful for the poems that we've read throughout that time and, and the amount of poetry we've read each year has been so moving and, and um, it's very, very challenging to just narrow it down to um, 30 or 40 for National Poetry Month because we've received so many wonderful submissions and you know, after doing this for a few years, we realized we had a body of work to put together in an anthology and that we could structure the anthology as um, as kind of a trail. Um, we tried to give you a little look at that in the um, in the in the slideshow where you're moving through different landscapes and ecosystems and topographies and um, and kind of feeling having this feeling of moving through through these different spaces through the poetry through the images and through um, uh, through short essays by us that talk to that mm -hmm. that talk to these ecosystems and what um, how they're made and and what they sustain. Um, so yeah, so that's that's where we are, and we are excited to have Wayfinding out through Finishing Lane Press. Yes, uh, they're publishing the book. It's coming out in for we're in pre sale right now. It is going to be published and sent around everyone in July. It's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we would you know Finishing Lane Press is a, a press. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. Uh, they're based in Kentucky. A lot of the poets had actually we noticed had been submitting with uh, Finishing Line as the, as a, a publisher of their work, and um, it was great. We we reached out to them. It seemed to be a great fit. Um, and we're really thrilled to have them. Uh, yeah, we feel really fortunate to be working with them. And so, yeah, here's the uh, the link if everyone wants to check a look at the book uh, through Finishing Line. There it is uh, in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> and then we're um, super glad to have Ranger Ashley Waymouth with us tonight from Hot Springs National Park. Um, <laughs> Ashley Ranger Ashley is um, oh, an incredible part. And I took her tour myself, and I, I think it's the only um, national park tour where I almost, you know, choked up. It was so moving and so poignant and, and just brought the history and the ecology and the space and the importance and the profundity of it to, you know, to life for me. And, and I just um, felt so grateful for her tour that as soon as we started scheduling these read readings, I, I felt like we need Ranger Ashley. So we're so glad she's here and we're going to turn it over to her um, in just a moment. Mm -hmm. We just want to also introduce the poets and have a moment maybe where we could um, unmute our mic and just give some actual real live applause to welcome them as well. Um, so without further ado, we want to welcome Catherine Hester, Iris Jamal Dunkel, Kristen Bryant Rajan, Francis Opila, Susan Melinda Dunlap, Alicia Hokanson, Mary Christine Kane, Emily Hockaday, Pam Allen, Liz Paul, and Laura Foley. Thanks again. Yay. We're so glad you're here. And we're going to turn it over to Ranger Ashley. For our virtual tour to Hot Springs National Park, which is in its centennial this year as well. I think we might hear a little bit about that. Let's <laughs> see. Well, hello, everybody. I am so grateful to be here. Thank you, Amy Beth, for inviting me. Thank you for hosting. This is such an exciting and beautiful event. Um, so let me get my screen shared. 
So I am coming to you from Hot Springs National Park. And as was mentioned, this is our centennial year. So 2021 marks 100 years that we have been known as a national park, but our history is far older than that, as you might imagine. But we are one of, we were among the first pieces of federally protected land in the United States. So starting in 1832, Congress set us aside as hot springs reservation in order to preserve and protect the thermal springs that flow here and ensure that they could never be monopolized. And you know, when people visit hot springs, and I'll walk you through this, but when people visit hot springs, you know, as maybe you now, right, when you close your eyes, when you imagine yourself visiting hot springs, I'm sure that most people imagine a wild landscape or something sitting either at the you know, at the base of mountains or surrounded by some kind of volcanic activity. Um, but here at our park, it couldn't be farther from the truth. So to me, when I think of Hot Springs National Park, this is a place where I believe the human spirit and the thermal water themselves ebb and flow together and have for thousands of years. So this is actually a picture of just a small piece of our national park. And maybe at first glance, when you look at it, you think, wait, that doesn't look like a park. That looks like a city. And in fact, it's true. Hot Springs sits right in the middle of downtown. The National Park sits right in the middle of downtown Hot Springs. So on one side of the street, the side of the street that's facing us, you can see, if you look closely, these huge buildings. Those are all of our bathhouses. And immediately across on the other side of the street is downtown. It's the city of Hot Springs. And behind us, as you see that view, as it extends from the base of the bathhouses out, those are the Washita Mountains. And as it extends further towards the horizon, that is the recharge zone for our springs. So it's easy to see when people come to visit, they're not expecting to visit an urban landscape. They're not expecting to walk into a national park when we think of these vast spaces like Yellowstone or Yosemite or Grand Teton. You know, we imagine these pieces of wilderness that have been untouched by human hands. We imagine these pieces of land and we feel connected to these pieces of land that feel removed from the human experience and offer us something different. But here, Hot Springs, we wouldn't be what we are today without the influence of humans and without humans' desire to come here for relief, for protection, for refuge. So once upon a time, we imagine that Hot Springs actually looked something like this. This is an early lithograph from the early 1800s. On the side, you know, it sort of looks like there's this melting rock. Those are basically what we imagine the hot springs probably looked at. And all of that water are the hot springs themselves, you know, just surrounded by these open fields and really not a lot of human interaction. But once President Jefferson bought the, you know, once we went through with the Louisiana Purchase, ultimately, they sent an expedition down to this area, the Hunter Dunbar expedition, and they discovered and they wrote about these hot springs. And so when they brought the science and when they brought the information back to President Jefferson, word slowly got out that uh, in the new territory, not too far away from the colonies, not too far away from where people already were, was this wellspring, this retreat. And so people slowly started to come here and the water itself comes out of the ground 143 degrees. So it's incredibly hot. So people would build these rudimentary shacks, you know, even just to stick their feet in it. There are 47 different hot springs that come out of the base of Hot Springs Mountain. And in these early times, people assigned a different name to them based on what they thought they would heal. So this one was called the Cornhole Spring. So you can see all of the women have their skirts up and their feet in, probably to relieve whatever bunions or corns they might have had on their feet. There were other springs called like arsenic spring. And it was thought if you soaked in that spring for a bit of time, then the arsenic would heal your liver. And so 
you know, the legends and the mythology about what this water offered to people grew. And as these, as the word spread and as the practice of hydropathy spread across the nation, what went from an open landscape to rudimentary shacks then became these wooden bathhouses that people started to build over the springs or even a distance away from the springs so the water would have enough time to travel and cool down so that way you wouldn't burn yourself to bits if you tried to get in it. But you can see this picture is from the 1860s. You know, so 1804 is the Louisiana Purchase. In 1832, we were made a federal reservation and the federal government said, hey, this is our land, nobody can monopolize it. And yet still, bathhouses were built in the 1850s and 1860s by people who just chose to ignore that this federal mandate was anything at all. Because the concept, and I mean, all of this is really because the concept of a national park did not exist. Congress knew they wanted to protect the land. They knew they wanted to make sure the springs could never be monopolized, but they didn't know how. You know, they thought they could just write a piece of paper, send it into the ether, and then everybody would abide by it. But that clearly isn't how it happened. So in the late 1800s, after a series of many court decisions, Hot Springs Reservation ultimately had to reconfigure its boundaries and had to have a superintendent, the very first superintendent assigned to it. So that way they could set forth rules and policies and regulations and ensure that if people were operating bathhouses and using the thermal water, they were doing so in accordance with the law. And so Hot Springs, because we were the first and because we had all of these unexpected and unforeseen problems sort of early on, we helped to create a framework for what the National Park Service would do when it eventually came into creation. By knowing what problems would exist, by knowing that we needed a superintendent, by knowing that there needed to be humans on the ground to be able to manage these spaces, it created room for park rangers to come into the picture. Now these bathhouses over time started to become more and more intricate and the city of Hot Springs wanted to become more and more appealing. At the height of the bathing industry in the 1930s, 40s, some bathhouses, one individual bathhouse would give over a million baths a year. And I feel like to us, this sounds so foreign, like why on earth would you travel to take a bath? You know, why imagining the road structures, right? There aren't even really roads here. People are kind of using trolleys, kind of using rail cars. We don't really have a public transportation system necessarily. Most of the journey to Hot Springs had to be done via some kind of trolley or wagon or cart. And so it wasn't an easy journey. So why on earth would people even choose to make it? And it all, Again, it all comes down to the water. People believed that the thermal springs, because it was so rich in minerals, had the capacity to cure any illness, any ailment, any disease. People that were told by their physicians that they had no other options, they told them, well, I guess you could try the miracle waters in hot springs. And for a lot of people that worked, for some people, I'm sure it didn't, but it didn't stop people from coming and it didn't stop the park and the bathhouses themselves from growing. Because during this time in our history, we didn't really have access to penicillin. We didn't have modern medicine. We didn't have indoor plumbing. We didn't have our own bathrooms in our homes. It wasn't until the 1950s and 60s that homes actually started to have their own private bathing spaces. And so you can imagine that if you're somebody who is ill, if you're somebody who is sick, and you don't have access to clean water, you don't have access to a place where you can bathe your entire body from head to toe and clean whatever pathogens you might have off of it, having the opportunity to do so is life-changing. So this is a look at what our bathhouse is. This is only two of them in the shot, but this is kind of how the bathhouses ended up you know, from where they started to the two pictured were the two most elaborate and the two most grandiose bathhouses at their heyday. 
the Maurice is the white building on the left, my left, I suppose, and the Fordyce is the tan building with the red roof. And both of these, the interiors in their heyday were filled with Italian marble. The Fordyce has stained glass almost on every single floor. The floors themselves are inlaid with the most intricate tile patterns. Everything about these bathhouses just shows the human devotion, not just to the practice of bathing, but in my mind, I feel like they were making altars. They're making these spaces to the water itself. And so part of this image, the bigger one with like the open room and the tubs and these bigger tubs, this is actually from a building called the Government Free Bathhouse. So one of the things that sets Hot Springs National Park apart from other parks, aside from us being so urban and so human filled, but is that we are mandated to give our water away for free. The whole reason we were set aside as a reservation was to ensure that everybody, regardless of race, regardless of class, regardless of creed, could come and enjoy the healing benefits of the water. And so we created a government-free bathhouse where anybody who could not afford to bathe in one of the luxurious bathhouses could still come and be treated, could still come and receive a bath. And so a lot of times when you received a bath, you had a bathhouse attendant in one of those pictures. And truthfully, you know, the big motto for the town and the big motto for the park was, we bathe the world. And it's interesting because a lot of the bathhouse attendants, most of the bathhouse attendants were African-Americans. And they found that actually the bathing industry, I mean, we know today that it was grueling absolutely grueling work because they had 12 hour days. They were working with hot water all day long in humid conditions without air conditioning. And they're constantly bathing people from dawn until dusk. But a lot of them attest and we have records and oral histories of them attesting to how this was a chance for them to make more money than they ever could have made in any other industry during this time period. This image at the bottom, it's one of, we call it the Hubbard tub, but often people with polio or people with rheumatoid arthritis or people that were just told that they would never walk again. We had these apparatuses that could carry them through the bathhouses and lay them in the tub. And then they could do water therapy in the hot water itself in hopes that this might give them an opportunity to walk again, to feel again, right? Again, everything is just dedicated to this bringing humans back into their essence, bringing humans back into the fullness of themselves all through thermal water. And so today, a lot of our bathhouses, because clearly we have penicillin, we have bathtubs, we have access to sanitary living conditions and clean drinking water, most of us for the most, you know, largely, but today we have thermal fountains like this all throughout the park where people can fill up their water. They fill up their jugs with the thermal springs water. So this water coming out of the tap is like 120 degrees. And so all day long, you'll see locals, you'll see visitors, you'll see people just filling up these jugs to drink the water, take it home. I've heard stories from people saying that ever since they've been drinking the water here, they don't have a single cavity anymore. Or I've heard other stories where people with really bad skin issues like eczema, they'll use the water as a rinsing soak at the end of their bath and their eczema is gone. And so even today, right, even with all of the medicine that we have access to, there is still this feeling, and I, I don't know that it's magic, but there is still this wondrous, this mysterious connection between the people and the thermal springs water itself. So this is a shot of our thermal springs. And this water, to me, I mean, what blows my mind even more is just that this water originally fell as rain 4,000 years ago. And I feel like as a human, it's so hard to comprehend that kind of scope in time. So let's just say that this rain first fell when the pyramids of Egypt were built. 
And this water has been traveling in darkness into the ground for 4,000 years. And it travels six to 8,000 feet deep. The deeper it goes, the hotter it gets. The longer it stays underground, the hotter it gets until it finally reaches the fault lines at the base of the mountain and comes up. So this water, this is the first time it has seen the light of day in 4,000 years. And often when I think about it, I imagine myself on this imaginary timeline where I'm standing in the middle and I'm looking back 4,000 years and I'm seeing the pyramids of Egypt and I'm imagining myself as the water, seeing the humans then and everything they were experiencing then and then traveling in darkness la 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 everything's so lovely i'm getting nice and warm oh here i am again and i'm here and looking around at humans now like trying to fathom how far and how different or maybe even how similar we are in these two time periods and then if i turn the other way and i look four thousand years in the future what will humanity be like then I have no idea. I don't know that any of us have any idea. But so, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, we mentioned that this is our centennial and it feels like a big deal because yay, we're 100 years old. But really in this park to manage it, to take care of it, to understand it, to know it, we really have to be thinking on a much bigger timeline. We really have to be looking at the next 4,000 years because everything that we do here Everything we do in our little urban park will affect the water for thousands of years to come. Even though we will be long gone, our essence will continue to be carried on. So that's all I have for you um, for this presentation. But I do, my husband is also a poet and he clearly, right? He doesn't, well, he's a seasonal ranger this year, but listening to me and following me around the park and coming on tours with me, um, he decided to write this poem. So I will share that now. Let me stop sharing my screen. And it's titled Hot Springs National Park, Keep Right On Flowing by Thomas Weymouth. People found it by the vapors in the valley rising, where Navaculite tapers to thermal uprising. They found hot springs bubbling where the south wind was blowing. The water, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. Folks dug out their own holes and built ramshackle shacks to bathe first, then quench thirst, to cure bunions and backs. Soon papers would write, healing waters worth going, the waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. Here was the first piece of land this country reserved. Folks began to gather around the first who observed. The spring's fan base was growing, no signs of slowing. The waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. The shacks soon transformed into bathhouses so grand. They rivaled England and France for the best in the land. Streets lined with carriages, stained glass proudly showing. The waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. Then in 1921, a park it was named. T'was measured a treasure that should never be claimed. Now all could quaff from its geological furrowing. The waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. Soon doctors, lawyers, ball players, and thieves all came to experience the water's reprieves. This water heals all. The reviews were quite glowing. The waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. When World War II raged and soldiers came home wounded, hot springs would heal them best, the army concluded. One of the nation's five spots to help them keep going. The waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. The hot springs drew so many of many types of fame, Al Capone for his syphilis, Babe Ruth for his game. Soaking served all, no matter what seeds they were sowing, and the waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. Then the times began to change, as times often do. Public bathing declined, modern medicine grew. 
folks bought tubs and began the bathhouse foregoing. But the waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. So these buildings of beauty, so opulent and rare, fell to predestined grasp of time's slow disrepair. Yet the park fell to these walls, still had gifts worth bestowing. Then the waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. Much of the building use has changed on old bathhouse row. The Fordyce, a museum with its relics on show. Superior's beer's flawless taste to the springs it's now owing. The waters, unknowing, just kept right on flowing. The rangers here understand much better than most how this park's human past makes for stories verbose. With rich natural sagas unique and still growing, and the waters, unknowing, still keep right on flowing. The rangers tell how the springs have survived floods and fires, but they've been threatened most by greedy human desires. We must protect our watersheds to keep them ongoing. So though they're unknowing, they can keep right on flowing. It's been 100 years since Hot Springs was a park, though most of our nation is still in the dark. A year long celebration, I hear they are thrilling, while the waters unknowing will keep right on flowing. And if raindrops could speak, they'd tell a story so vast, how today's soak was rain from 4,000 years past. A path of least resistance that's more easygoing, the wisdom of growing while keeping right on flowing. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like you and your husband transported us through so time, both prose and poetry. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's nice to do it both ways. <laughs> um, yes. I felt like we could take maybe two questions for Ashley. If, um, if anyone has, um, you can use the virtual hand raise button at the bottom, or you can type a question in the chat. Chat's open. <laughs> um, yeah, it was an amazing tour. Yes. Yeah, the time, the idea of time. I hadn't really thought about it that way mm -hmm. in the park. It really is so unique. Wow. Any questions for Ranger Ashley? Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, it was a um, and I think that your husband would really love how you read the poem too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, so in the poem that brings up uh, Al Capone, um, oh wait, here's a question. How do you know the timeline goes back 4,000 years? Yeah, so we um, we actually do testing on the water and I think it's through carbon dating. It's like carbon dating, but it's not. It's something different for water where we can test the, not radioactivity, but where we can test and see which rocks and I don't know, our hydrogeologist knows more, but um, yeah, through special scientific testing, we can see that the water is 4,000 years old. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And then Annie asks in the chat, how many people come each day? Each day, mm, it's hard to say, but we get like 1.5 million visitors a year. Oh, that's We're that's usually a lot, like, right? yeah, we used to be like the most visited national park for a long time because we were more accessible than other national parks were. Um, but now we're at like the 19th most visited national park. It's still pretty high up. I mean, considering, yeah, that's pretty <laughs> yeah. amazing. Yeah, other people are saying it's beautiful. They're really inspired to come visit. And I think we are too. Yeah. I know you were here not too long ago, but yeah. it's, it, yeah, it reminds us, yeah, it's such an amazing, unique yeah, it's place. It's very, very, uh, it's unlike any other park I visited because of that downtown and rustic being right next to each other. Yeah. Um, well, that was amazing and a wonderful transition to some more poetry. <laughs> so we're going to now hear thanks from- Thanks again, uh, Ranger thanks. Ashley. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, you're so welcome. We're going to hear from some um, wayfinding poets, and we're going to start out at one of the most iconic national parks, the Grand Canyon, with um, Catherine Hester. Hi. I am so happy to be here with you guys. Um, thank you, Ashley, for your sort of behind the scenes uh, tour of Hot Springs. And thank you also to Amy, Beth, and Derek, not just for organizing this event tonight, but for your vision, um, for having the idea to marry our public spaces and poetry, which led to the creation of the anthology. Um, also, probably 
we should thank Finishing Line Press for publishing this book because without them, there wouldn't be one. Um, but really most importantly, and most especially, I'd like to thank all of the viewers who have turned out, plugged in, logged on, however you wanna call participation in a Zoom event. Um, thank you for supporting and being interested in both parks and our poet in poetry. We're glad you're here. The poem I'm about to read is about the Grand Canyon. Um, more specifically, it's about hiking from the South Rim down to the Colorado to Phantom Ranch at the bottom and then back out. Um, this is something I had the good fortune to be able to do uh, seven years ago with my husband and two daughters who were eight and 12 at the time. The scope of the Grand Canyon is very hard to take in. Um, park surveys, have shown that the average visit to the Grand Canyon is really only about seven hours. And of those seven hours, the average visitor to the, um, the Grand Canyon only spends about 17 minutes looking at the canyon itself. The rest of the time, they're probably in one of the gift shops. There are a lot of them on the rim. Um, This is that 17 minutes is just a blink of the eye when you consider the fact that the rock formations at the bottom of the canyon are hundreds of millions of years old. When you hike, though, time changes, it slows down. As you move down the trail, you move through layers of rock and you move through time. There's even a common saying to help you remember the names of all those layers of rocks on the Grand Canyon. Know the canyon's history, study rocks made by time. Metamorphism. Know the canyon's history, study rocks made by time is what the sunburned river runner said at the three mile rest house as we were coming out. Because the shift and settle, wrench and uplift are a large S, we can neither grip nor grasp without resorting to mnemonics. Dust and heat and sky and shadow, shale, limestone and sandstone, from small to large and back again, all has been ground down into the finest powder of its elements. We went down by one trail, came up by another. The canyon wrung us out, exerted pressure, burned off the unnecessary, left the best, the whippoorwill's call, the scouring, scouring red dust, the implacable mineral gleam of water birthed from the very bottom of the dam. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for staying up until two in the morning to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine is in Spain. Um, so uh, we're really glad she was able to be here. And now we're going to California with Iris Jamal Dunkel. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Can you guys hear me all right? Okay, good. Um, it's been, um, a, I've, I've had the honor of having two of my poems um, accepted into this uh, wonderful anthology. And um, they both later um, were, uh, went into two of my latest books. So. Um, I'm going to read, the first one is set in Yosemite um, National Park, which is um, a big part of our family. Um, my mother was the um, Yosemite trail riding champion. <laughs> um, and we basically grew up um, always going to Yosemite um, every summer. But what really spoke to me about Yosemite was um, the way that it was actually taken away from the people who originally um, settled it. Um, the, um, who, who lived there before it was taken away. Um, I'm grateful that it was saved as a national park, but um, the people who lived there no longer live there um, anymore. Um, and this poem is, um, begins with a little um, note that says, Yosemite, which is Southern Miwok, or Yosemite, which is Central Miwok, originally referred to the Indian tribe that lived in the Yosemite Valley. Um, and it was not their own name that they chose for themselves. Um, Yosemite in their language literally means those who kill to stay where they love. 
Um, and so this is called At Yosemite with Max, age six. And I wrote it um, at a time when my son was suffering um, from sensory processing disorder. And so his way through life was so complicated. Um, and he kind of guided me um, through those years because of the way he saw the world differently, including Yosemite National Park, where we had gone, we go every single year. At Yosemite with Max, age six. We watch the golden net of leaves fall, then rise from the tree, suspended against the steep shadows of granite cliffs like golden notes. When he stops, I see his eyes gather awe. He will not walk on, is fixed and hungry to watch leaves circle in crisp valley air. Yesterday at the visitor center, we listened to a recorded child's voice speak a history for the Miwok from a diorama filled with plastic ghosts. Then we sat in a small redwood kocha, his body close, his questions circling mine, circling the stories we had heard. In this sweet darkness, there was the scent of earth between history and what's been forgotten. The valley is a granite bowl where the past still burns a cold silver thread through impossible stone. Under a one-eyed moon, those born here fought to the death to stay. This is what we do not say. Golden words like leaves netted in air, lost but continually returning. And my second poem is um, from my latest collection, just came out, you guys. Um, it's called Westfire Archive. Um, and this poem, uh, the book is focused on, um, uh, it's three sections and the first part focuses on um, the biography of Charmian Kittredge London, who was Jack Lennon's wife and who was completely misremembered, who actually helped write his books. So it focuses on the idea of biography. And then the second section is about autobiography, the idea of um, the self. Um, and it's about my experience in Northern California during the 2017 wildfires um, that burned through the urban landscape of Santa Rosa, California, while I was poet laureate um, at the same time that my mother died of ovarian cancer. And so it's a, it's a story of losing self and losing your home. Um, but the final section is, is about the West and this myth of the West that we have, that it's this indispensable um, object um, that we can continue, that Turner's thesis kind of um, messed us up to think that um, we could just keep taking from the land. Um, and this poem was written while I was hiking um, at uh, Roxborough State Park in Colorado. Um, and I say that right now with a big smile because I just got a knee replacement, a, a, two weeks ago. Um, so I can't wait till I can hike again um, without pain um, in, a few, in a few months. So this is called Breaking Trail at Roxborough State Park, Colorado. There are days when life juts out red and raw as sandstone. Think glaciers did it. Think those red teeth aren't, aren't trying to stain your heart. Here, the wild reeks of sage and pink blooms. It hums in the voices of crickets and birdsong. Unseen snakes fell away in the tall grass. But still, you walk forward toward whatever vista, vista you came to see. The meadow where pioneer cabins and their stories fall in on themselves. Try not to get buried. Even deer run longing for home. Thank you so much. And thank you, Parks and Point. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful context, too, for your poems. Um, so now, uh, Kristen Bryant Rajan is going to transport us to Cuyahoga Valley National Park and Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Amy, Beth, and Derek for doing this and for your warmth and positivity and for celebrating nature and art, precious resources. Um, and thank you, Ashley, for a great tour. 
<clears throat> so I have two poems. One um, has to do with sunrise and one has to do with um, sunset. So I think I'll begin with sunrise. <laughs> I have to confess, I am not a diehard camper. As a matter of fact, sometimes camping makes me a little grumpy. Like if um, the tent is leaking or if it's frigid cold as it was um, when I wrote this poem. Um, <clears throat> but I realized that when you're uncomfortable in nature, all you have to do is look up to find the healing. And even if there isn't a miraculous thermal spring, there's healing everywhere. And I think we could all benefit sometimes from just looking up whenever we're feeling stressed. And I think that we did that during the pandemic. I think nature um, provided solace for many of us. So um, <clears throat> this poem is called Road Trip, Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. <clears throat> After a long night, an empty stomach, relentless winds, sleeping on a stick, hidden from your touch by thick layers of sweaters, sleeping bags, hats, scarves, and mittens, I wake to light in Indiana. Birds and squirrels rustling through soggy leaves, a tone for a tent that will not stand, a toilet that will not flush. The cold Midwest wind in early spring builds mountains of sand but also blows away the burdens of this journey. I venture to the woods alone, crawling deep inside the morning darkness of this forest, climbing hills that grip my thighs and give me back my breath, then bumbling down steep slopes, struggling to keep pace with rapid rhythm, skipping, flying, hoping more than breakfast to maintain always this momentum. Running with the cadence of bird songs, I find light and breath with the sunrise. So my next poem <clears throat> has to do with um, a hike that I took at night, um, which I don't think I would do anymore. <laughs> but I have to say that um, it becomes so magical to hike at night because it's kind of like when you're looking at clouds and you see so many different uh, shapes, I, that happens in the forest too. So um, it was really quite magical, but um, really this poem is in honor of trees because a huge tree had fallen. And I realized that trees offer us so much, even when they're not upright, they, they are always giving. And so this is kind of appreciation for that. It's entitled Night Hike. Three hours after sunset, we take the bu Buttermilk Falls Trail. The breeze is gentle for Ohio in October. The air heavy with sweet nostalgia of how quickly seasons cool. Descending deep into the woods, we marvel at the pantomime around us, how shadows and trees animate at night. We approach a mound of darkness. You see a void, the anti-bonfire. I see a heap of buffalo, a sacrifice of sorts. We both see a massive arrow piercing through the textured shade. We find meaning in the dark shapes of the forest. As we step closer, our focus sharpens. A tree has fallen, pulling up dirt and roots with its descent. We peer beneath this majestic oak, surrendered to wind and time, to see ripped earth, dark, cool, moist, the delicate, sinewy strands of roots, white stars against the blackest sky of soil. We sit beneath the trunk in the cool, uprooted space the tree has made, in silence, in solemn darkness, this tree is protective still, even in its fall. Thank you. Thank you. I felt transported there at the, uh, to that tree.
Um, okay, thanks, Kristen. So now to the Columbia Basin with Francis Opila. Thank you. I'm Francis Opila, and I live in Portland, Oregon. And um, I'd like to echo the thanks to Amy Beth and Derek and Ashley and really everybody who came tonight to read or to uh, listen and watch. So um, the inspiration for this poem that I'm about to read came from a place, Tom McCall Preserve, which is a nature conservancy preserve, which is located on the Eastern side of the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area. And the uh, Columbia River Gorge is, cuts through the Cascade Mountains. And on the, the west side where, where I live, it's, it's kind of like temperate rainforest. And on the east side, it's sagebrush steppe, you know, it's dry grasslands. And, and this poem is titled Balsam Root in the Columbia Basin. And in the image behind me, there is a lot of balsam root there. And as you can see, it's uh, balsam root is in the sunflower family. And uh, this particular preserve, which I was just, I just went out there um, a couple of days ago and it's super windy there and very windy a couple of days ago. But um, there's lots of other wildflowers that, that grow there too, besides the balsam root. So balsam root in the Columbia Basin. The night of the hard frost, the icy moon showers its cold light on the rock soil. Dawn brings redwind blackbirds singing among meadowlarks. You wonder what song do you sing on the edge of your love as you thaw, opening to balsam root in bloom. Their sunny faces splash gold over the sagebrush steppe along basalt cliffs desert parsley, prairie lupin. You know your way home, but you're still adrift. Deep shadows sink on the Columbia below. Wind on the edge of the precipice. Turkey vultures soar on thermals and gusts. Thank you, beautiful. Um, we are going to now New Mexico. Elephant Butte State Park with Susan Melinda Dunlap. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, I'm, I apologize for my dog. Um, I'm Susan Melinda Dunlap. I'm a writer uh, living in the borderlands of New Mexico in a historic village called Messia. Um, thank you to Amy Beth and Derek and everyone um, who's here tonight involved in all this. My poem is called Dreaming the Land, and um, I wrote it about 10 years ago. It was inspired from uh, reading a lot of Jorge Luis Borges and also from arriving here in the desert for the first time and encountering a very large lake, um, which is called Elephant Butte Lake, and it's in Elephant Butte Lake State Park. Um, it's, uh, you know, a huge lake in the middle of a, of a vast desert landscape. Um, it exists because uh, the Rio Grande was um, dammed a long time ago. So uh, uh, my poem is Dreaming the Land. A wanderer tramped through the hills as of days of old. My name is Martin, he said to the chickens he saw. He said it to the lake. The lake turned away. The chickens pecked on and laid their eggs. The wanderer slept on a ledge, but nothing came to his mind's eye. He dove into the lake, into the moon's tail, he stared at stars from beneath the surface, flicked water at moon craters, pricked his finger on a bottle cap, just some floating flotsam and whispered, I am another's dream. Thank you. Thank you. And our experience tonight echoes a little bit of the water section of our book because um, there's a lot of flow from one body of water to another. And so now we're heading to the Truckee River with Alicia Hokinson. Hi, it's really great to be joining you here. And I'm in Seattle in the corner of the country. Nice to see some other people on the West Coast joining us too. Um, several years ago, I attended uh, the Community of Writers Poetry Week at Squaw Valley, California. And 
a couple friends and I really needed a break from the intensity of writing a brand new poem every day for workshop. So we decided to go river rafting on the nearby Truckee River to kind of get out of our heads and into the natural world. And this poem kind of documents that experience, um, but it also turned out to be a sort of an ars poetica. Rafting the Truckee, set upon blue pontoons that twitched like dousing rods. We went spinning down over deep pools where the river slows, marshy fescue and clotted eelgrass along the banks, water clear over silted boulders and waterlogged pines, went spinning past guys stomach flopped on inner tubes, past fishermen knee deep, casting into pools, rods pulling red lures against the green, past ducks scurrying toward us begging, diving for thrown wafers. We spun over brown gravel where water runs swifter in narrow runnels into the little thrill of white water, gasps in the rapids, nudging rocks and swirling around them, not quite making the angle we aimed for, hitting all the obstacles, rocks, low bridges, brushy margins with their hidden sticks, ducking under branches, raising orange paddles, fending off, we wanted the center, but the rudderless tube would not hold it. And toward the end, when the wind came up, pushed against us, we spun lazily or furiously. Our forward strokes did nothing until the river caught us in its line, pulling hard for the takeout, even in the last long rapid. What carried us was relentless, clear water moving all the way down. Thank you. That poem, it feels like we're moving. It feels like we're moving with you the whole time. Um, actually going to more bodies of water right now, Lake Erie um, with Mary Christine Kane. Hi. Well, I'm really happy to be here too. And I'm super happy to be part of Wayfinding. Um, thank you, Amy, Beth, and Derek, and for your labor of love and Ashley, that was super interesting. I think that was actually the most interesting Zoom presentation I have ever seen. <laughs> um, I have, yeah, I have two poems. I wanna read three short poems. The first two are about Lake Erie. Um, Lake Erie has been a really important body of water for our family. My, um, a lot of my relatives emigrated from Italy and they settled in Lakeview, New York, which, which is, and they lived just about a block away from Lake Erie. So they spent a lot of time there and we spent a lot of time there growing up. Um, and the first one's about my uncles who, when I think about them, I remember they like so often just smelled like the outside, you know trees or burning wood or um, winter, Lake Erie, New York. The uncles have been out on the ice again. They bring home trout, which grandma will bread and fry. Their bodies turn the kitchen cold. We breathe in chill. And then this one is summer, Lake Erie, New York and um, you know, when my brother and I were so excited to go visit grandma and grandpa and go to the beach and we thought it was the most magical place and we didn't understand at the time because we had never been to any other beaches that it was like not really the nicest beach. We always had to wear shoes because there were so many things you could hurt yourself on <laughs> on the sand and there were there were so many seagulls pooping all the time. Um, but nevertheless, we just we couldn't wait to get back to the beach and we thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Summer, Lake Erie, New York. Grandpa has bought new beach robes, white terry stitch with gold. I think this makes us look rich. I feel so fancy. I comb my hair 50 extra times. David and I watch her waves come from Canada. We see the skyline and dream of swimming to that other world. The lake is full of glass. She smooths their sharp edges into curves. We comb for hours, stepping over fish bones to uncover jewels of emerald, cobalt, amber. Grandpa lifts us on his shoulders and tosses us in. His black rim glasses catch glints of sun. We try not to get them wet. 
One year, I throw away a drawer full of glass, thinking it's silly. I wish I had that terry robe. I long for a piece of eerie glass. And this last one, um, actually, I just wrote this winter after a, a hike. I'm in Minnesota, even though I grew up in Buffalo, New York, which is why I was writing about Lake Erie. Um, uh, you know, this we did, you know, vacations close to home. So we ended up going up north <laughs> this winter to Tedaguch State Park. We had a we hiked there and it was minus 30 um, the day I wrote this poem. And but this is a love poem to winter. Dear Winter, I ignored you for so long, like those good men who only wanted to make me happy, but didn't have the flash of summer, the shiny sunglasses, tan chests, warm talk. I'm sorry. I see you now, really have been waiting for you all my life. Yours is a cold beauty. It is only when the world becomes very cold that we can see it clearly. Snow, pine, bark, sky, sun. Once I was afraid of you, but here you are welcoming us with your sunlit forests and sparkling hills. If I had a turn back time machine, I would see you also on all of the days I missed. Today, well below zero, I remove my wag, ragwood mitten, rag wool mitten, let my bare finger write your name in the snow. I wrote it again and again. That is how I've etched your name into my heart. Winter, winter, winter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're so, so excited to have Winter Lake Erie, New York in wayfinding. And it actually wasn't intentional that we are heading to yet another body of water. A lot of water. <laughs> Emily Hall to Hockaday. Emily Hockaday is going to take us to Fire Island to the Salt Marsh. Hi, um, I'm located in Queens, New York, and my poem is set on Fire Island. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Fire Island, it's a long, skinny barrier island just to the south of Long Island. So it's not too far from me. Um, and it is a, it's all a beach national park, um, which is funny because when I was a kid, I thought that I hated the beach because you can't read there. It's very bright, sand flies in your face. The pages are always blowing from the wind. Um, and it wasn't until I went to Fire Island that I realized I had never really experienced like a wild beach and it's gorgeous. And I, am, I love Fire Island and have written many poems about it. This is one of them. It is titled Wilderness. Sober, I see this island for what it is. I have always been able to be still here. Tonight at dusk, the mosquitoes were thin, so we ventured out to the marsh on the bayside and watched fish jump in the small clearings of marsh grass. Animals come and go. Populations swell and plummet. Dominance is always passing along. This is a healthy, moving ecosystem. After my father died, the ecology of my brain became flooded with adrenaline, and I'm still trying to rebalance the chemicals. An animal bone rests on the side of the boardwalk, left by a fox. I haven't seen one yet, but they are deep in the dune foliage. Predators are vital to the health of this community. The bone is curved, alone, open, parenthesis. Thank you, and thanks to Derek, Amy, Beth, Ashley, the fellow poets, and everyone here listening. Thank you so much. Um, that was a wonderful tour de force through the water, through several bodies of water. And now we are heading back west with Pam Allen to Agua Caliente, California. This is such a wonderful event because of the camaraderie that people who love the outdoors have. The energy is so palpable. And it was true last month too with the reading. And I really appreciate Amy, Beth, and Derek, how you've pulled this project together. 
And I hope you just keep doing it more and more and more. It was great. And Ashley, I've never been to Hot Springs. My husband has, but it was really new for me to see that whole presentation. So thank you very much. Um, everyone's poems remind me of places that I have been and lived. I grew up on Long Island, Emily, and I went to Jones Beach every day as a kid. And then I lived in South Florida for years and Sanibel Island, we would go to Sanibel Island all the time when there was only one restaurant on the entire island, which was just super. And now I'm in New England and I can walk out my front door. I can walk up the dirt road and within a mile access the Appalachian Trail. So the Appalachian Trail is my backyard and I can go there in the summer and take a walk. In the winter, I can snowshoe it. And so that's really super, but I love the desert. So the desert calls to me in many places and the Agua Caliente Indian Reservation in California was a place that I had never known about, but we flew out to Palm Springs to visit to relatives who lived in uh, Southern California and wound up day hiking at Agua Caliente. It is an Indian reservation of 32,000 acres. Over 6,000 of those acres are in Palm Springs. So essentially the Cahuilla uh, band of the, uh, the Agua Caliente Indians own most of Palm Springs, which is really nice to know. I like that a lot. I could not hike the day I wrote this poem. I had a, a um, infection in my toe and I had to sit and look out at the trails while my husband did a day hike. And so this poem talks about seeing a hike and having to look at the colors and just experience being in the outdoors without actually walking and walking through it. So this is the name of the poem, Being at Indian Canyon, Agua Caliente Indian Reservation. Rocks rest like tilted pillows and behemoth beds. Birds rest, no breeze ruffling their feathers or the pleats of skirted palms. I rest too prop an injured foot, trying to put disappointment aside, needing a good swig of cactus juice to let the day be what it will, beyond my hunger to devour the place, trek off and scramble every nook, crack, and slab. Instead, I gobble up the view, mouthfeel of almond, olive, honeycomb, toasted flax, ginger snap, for once not trying to control how the desert would go on without me, why I'm splayed like a lizard beneath the lemonade sun. Thank you. Um, staying in the desert for a little longer with Liz Paul and heading to Big Bend National Park. Um, I think. Um, so I'm in Virginia now, but um, was in Illinois and headed to uh, Texas for a spring break. And um, that experience is sort of the genesis of this piece. Um, not too much story around it really to share. I'm hoping the piece will, I think the piece has a little bit of context for you. Um, before the piece though, I'll just echo the big thanks um, to Amy, Beth and Derek that we're all feeling for such a wonderful event tonight. Um, thanks to Ranger Ashley and, and to everybody sharing and attending tonight. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing and I think feeling too about healing and, and um, that's been something I wasn't expecting and just a neat, neat thing to be feeling tonight. Thanks everybody. Um, so this piece is called For the Escape and the Bonding. For the escape and the bonding, we went to nature again, to Big Bend, for the heat and the strangeness of cacti mountains and javelina. The worst part was when we summited Emory Peak, the last 10 minutes bouldering with a bulky backpack messing with my balance, my wedding ring scraping against each hold, 
the top narrow and windy, and I too dizzy to look around. I felt old. When I was young and single, I thought I might have felt freaked out, but I knew then how to ignore it. But I wasn't sure that was true. The best part was when we swam in our underwear in the Rio Grande. We waited for the canoe groups to go by, the river just a narrow current there, so shallow the boats scraped against the stones. Then we piled our clothes like soft cairns and waded in. You showed me how to do a push-up to dunk myself in shallow water, something you learned from your uncle who drowned in a river almost a year ago and halfway around the world, disappeared like you once did, 500 miles up this same Rio Grande. We were rafting and you fell in, completely submerged, it was just for a moment, but in that moment, I couldn't believe how quickly and entirely you were gone from my world. On the drive home, we pulled over at the immigration checkpoint. And where were you born? The soldier asked you. I forget that you have an accent. It never occurred to me to bring our passports. But I'm a born and raised American, which was apparent to the soldier who trusted in fragile belongings and waved us on. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, we have one more reader tonight, Laura Foley, whose poem ends with a such a beautiful final image. So we, you know, it's a nice way to to close the program. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to thank the poets for their beautiful words and images and and reading because it's. I always uh, the the first event we did. I remembered how special it is to hear poetry read aloud, and um, you know what a different experience that is than reading it on the page. And um, we're just grateful for the community that's formed around this book, and glad for all of you to be here and and um, and for our guests our audience to be here as well did you want to yeah it's echoes the same sentiments yeah it's been okay. amazing tonight so mm -hmm. ending in a good place now that summer's coming which is acadia national park with laura okay um yes i also would like to thank everyone who's here for this evening um for this book which sounds really wonderful and i also have this feeling a heart feeling uh of connection through national parks and through all the variety of, of uh, geographies. And, um, and I also wanna be, I'm also feeling grateful to uh, Teddy Roosevelt and all those who, uh, who had the vision to, to have this, um, these lands preserved. So this poem I'm going to read, is, it's a short poem. Uh, it's really about discovering something when I was a, a teenager. And, um, and what I discovered was, that I probably wasn't gonna be a, um, a geologist or an oceanographer. Uh, probably I was going to do something different. It's called Lost and Found. On my sophomore science field trip to the rocky Maine coast, I sat captivated by a tidal pool, a little village of crawling crabs, snails, starfish darting a sea anemone appearing to sing. I stayed so long, I forgot the rising tide, my teachers, classmates waiting on the bus. On the exam, I couldn't calculate the pitch of waves or chemical composition of anything, but I knew how to lose myself in the world of tiny shifting things. Thank you. Thank you. So um, again, so wonderful to have all of you here. Um, Wayfinding is in its advanced sale period, which means it's available through May 28th um, for a pre-sale. And um, you know, uh, it'll be shipped in July <laughs> and um, available via Finishing Line Press. If anyone has any questions or thoughts for the poems, you're welcome to pop them in the chat. Um, I'd love to just unmute and give all the poets one more um, round of applause. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. It was a really amazing evening. Thanks. And um, yeah, please do consider uh, going for the uh, the book. We. <laughs> We have our, our pre-sale period. There's the little little plug there for it. Um, and yeah, beautiful. 
Beautiful work. Thanks, Beautiful work, everyone. Kima. And it's really a pleasure to meet you all. I, not everything needs to be virtual <laughs> or, or just via email. It's nice to actually talk to you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for attending tonight. Uh, we have one more event, too, coming up uh, towards 26. the end of May 26th. Oh, uh, yes. All new poets. Uh, <laughs> May 26th, uh, Cynthia Dormany of uh, LBJ National Historical Park will be here and Waco Mammoth National Monument. So um, she's going to give us a tour of some Texas sites and um, we'll have uh, 12 poets from Wayfinding once again. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again, Ashley, Ranger Ashley, and yeah, all the poets you read. So all right. Take Bye. care, everyone.